Okay, great. Um, hello, everyone. First of all, thank you, everyone at uh, ELS and in particular, the organizing committee for giving me the opportunity to have this talk. Um, yeah, so the title of my talk is Sustaining Lunar Exploration Through Worldwide S Public Support. And I will get into details of what I really mean by that and some key con considerations that I think um, as an observer of global series exploration, uh, that I think we may not be considering as intensely. Next slide, please. Yeah, for those of you who don't know me, um, I am a space exploration writer and uh, my flagship writing is Moon Monday, which is, uh, which is basically the world's only dedicated newsletter to covering lunar exploration updates from around the world. And I have been globally published on various publications, both in India, where I where I'm from, as well as uh, abroad. And so this is the context where I'm coming from. So everything that I say, uh, I think it would be useful if you could take it from that lens. Uh, so as an observer of space exploration activities around the world and you know tracking all the updates that have happened uh, you know, over the last five years as NASA planned Artemis clips and many other programs came into being. Next slide, please. Okay, so the thing that everyone in this room knows is that we have been building up a renewed return to our moon, and that's excellent. And it's not been just for the last five years, but rather for the last two decades, in fact, because from ESA to ISRO to CNSA and many others. We have many countries have been sending their first missions to the moon. Some of them have been very successful. Uh, and so that, that really shows like there has been a global impetus. And of course, um, NASA itself has been sending multiple orbiters starting with LRO and in the meanwhile has managed to force a very exciting and possibly the most ambitious space program in history with Artemis, which we all hope uh, succeeds really well. Next slide, please. Yes, but the thing that I think we should remember is that even though there is a global impetus and more countries and organizations of all sorts are sending moon missions than ever before, there are some unique conditions that are there now which haven't been there in history. Some of them are positives, but some may not be so. So for example, now we have uh, both private missions to the moon as well as non-traditional country first. What do I mean by that? Uh, I mean, uh, countries no longer need to develop their own launch vehicles and even moon landers for that matter to send their rover to the moon. Uh, just as one example, uh, you could be anywhere on that hardware stack. Uh, so basically the barrier to entry has been lowered, which has led to this, which is, which is what in part has led to this increased number of moon missions. But there's, and that naturally has also resulted in many collaborative fronts uh, as well as low cost avenues. So that all is great. But at the same time, what has happened is that we have started to build various programs based on these abilities, which are yet to be proven. Uh, of course, to be clear that I'm, I'm very much rooting for these new kinds of missions to be successful. And I think we all are in this very room, uh, especially with CLIPS and um, Artemis and, and, and particularly its human landing system and so on. But I think there's something that we do not need to forget is that uh, if we place these programs on the critical path uh, to the success of our moon missions, especially in the case of Artemis, then there are many more considerations that we need to take to ensure that we can sustain the funding for that. Next slide, please. Yes, so at, at the so as even as we are having many more missions uh, to the moon, uh, again, uh, the reason we need to consider that there might be several uh, 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 slipping points in as we forge a, uh, you know, a return to the moon, that moon missions remain risky as ever. And I think everyone in this room uh, I'm addressing to knows this way better than I do, that moon missions require uh, still require orchestrating you know, hundreds to thousands of people, and they remain complex and in resource intensive endeavors. And we only need to look at the last four years of moon exploration, where save for Changi 5, we have basically had, uh, in terms of landings, uh, three back-to-back uh, -back landing failures, uh, again, other than Changi 5. So we have had, uh, unfortunately, uh, the Space Isle Barashit lander crash on the moon, 
the Chandrayaan 2 lander crash on the moon. Uh, and of course, uh, most recently, uh, Hakuto are unfortunately also crashing on the moon. So moon missions remain risky. And the reason I point out this slide is that even as we are very excited about our return to the moon, so am I. But uh, if we are going to mount the successes of our most critical moon missions uh, on programs that we are yet to reinforce with in terms of mechanisms and fundings and so on, then we might be in for much more delays and failures and we should embrace that. Next slide, please. So uh, one of the ways I could highlight that is uh, two programs. One is NASA Clips and ESA Moonlight. There are some others, but this should be serving as good illustrations where even with the uh, Clips missions where NASA does envision eventually the Clips vendors having uh, commercial payloads as a majority of the customers. And I'm very glad to see that 22 machines and Astrobotic have made a great headway in that direction, but we are still not at the majority of the uh, uh, funded payloads being commercial yet. Uh, so the fact remains that NASA or, an, or a space agency for that matter, a national space agency, which is tax funded, remains the anchor customer. That is also true for ESA's upcoming Moonlight uh, Navigation and Communications Constellation, uh, where again, ESA is the anchor customer, even though they do envision having uh, commercial um, applications of it, which might be leveraged later on. But to begin with, uh, as we do with Lunar Pathfinder a few years later, it will, ESA remains the anchor customer. And the secondary customer for Pathfinder is also NASA. So technically, you're not escaping the space agency uh, uh, dependency on a national space agency, even though you are saying that you know we are having private and commercial missions. Next slide, please. And of course, the uh, most important bit, I think, uh, or at least the most critical bit in our sustained renewed return to the moon is that the human landing systems that NASA has selected with SpaceX and Blue Origin also depend on, uh, you know, having a commercial and private inclusion where majority of the funding does in this case come from, seems to be coming from uh, the uh, companies themselves. However, NASA is still putting in a good chunk of the money uh, for this endeavor. And so ultimately, as again, this is part of a large domino effect, like is this part connect this part of a large connected program. So every uh, failure and delay anywhere. So even for, for example, if, if the SLS rocket faces delays, ultimately delays these missions as well uh, because of the program architecture. But the point is that not only are commercial and private missions, even though by definition they should be independent or can be independent or desire to be independent, they are not only having National Space Agency as anchor customers, but the reverse is also true where National Space Programs are now putting commercial missions on the critical path. Again, um, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, at least in my opinion. Uh, it, it might work out excellent, uh, and that's what I think what we are all hoping for, but it's something to watch out for. Next slide, please. Two minutes to go. Thank you. So I think um, so. I think the point has been made that there's no alternative to public buy-in and funding, right? And so that's what we need to consider. In that context, we need to consider that we might want to do more forms of communications and outreach across the globe. Next slide, please. And but at the same time, the same the same people who are funding our uh, missions across the globe, uh, depending on which national space agency you look at, uh, the taxpayers have very little awareness of the insight, like of the breadth, depth, or the purpose of lunar exploration activities. Next slide, please. And that is precisely why, at least partly why I write Moon Monday, because what I observe is that even people with, there's so much happening in lunar exploration that even people within the lunar communities uh, are not always aware of the finer bits and pieces moving here and there across the global lunar ecosystem that we are trying to like mount missions from, uh, that the, the, the kind of global missions that we are mounting uh, to the moon from. And so this is uh, just to illustrate that while this is just one person's effort, even there I'm seeing that there are many people relying on this sort of a newsletter for their primary uh, front of information. So imagine the number of people across the world who have absolutely no idea of why we do moon, moon exploration and only see random bits and pieces here and there uh, whenever the press decides to cover something at scale. Next slide, please. 
So I basically have a few sets of recommendations and I'll, I'll be done in two minutes. Uh, uh, and that basically covers this spectrum. Again, these are just my recommendations. There's much more to do and much more to consider. Next slide, please. So the first recommendation that I have is enhance your websites with email alerts and RSS feeds and more press releases everywhere. I think that allows you to work with journalists and creators at scale, which you might not be considering right now. And not just that, go ahead and proactively pitch to you know, media publication editors and journalists to write about your research or project or even the larger themes, many of which we have seen in this conference uh, in terms of tracks of the talks. Uh, and also, I think we need to learn more, uh, run more community uh, explainer blogs, the likes of Astrobytes and Nature's Behind the Papers. Uh, or in fact, even in our own lunar community, LROC featured image is an excellent blog, but I think it's kind of the only one. So I think we need more of that. Next slide, please. And we make it the last slide. Uh, sure. So yeah, and I, I think don't ignore creators. And uh, that's because they reach with newsletters um, and also with in, in regional languages, huge volumes of people who you would not be reaching otherwise, or the or the kinds of niches that media you know, niches that media publications don't reach otherwise. And also on the same lines, if you could have, let's say, in all of these lunar conferences, if we could have uh, something like uh, sessions which incentivize writers as well as researchers to do more outreach, I think that would be great. Uh, so similarly, like to close off with one last recommendation, I think. Uh, Quick Map is a great tool, not just for scientists, but also for people like me who are trying to get the word out to more people. Uh, but we need more kinds of tools like that. So a paper, paperscape, if you are aware of it, is a visual tool to visualize research papers and how they are connected. A lunar equivalent would be very great. Thank you.